what I want to talk about is a piece of software that we are restoring from this machine that was built in, uh, in about 1950 here at MIT. Um, the <clears throat> machine was done at the beginning of the Cold War and has, um, was the start of a long and very important thread of technology that ran through the Cold War, as we will discuss. Um, uh, as we talk about this, I think one thing to keep in mind, just to remember in the theme of <coughs> um, history at MIT, much of what MIT has done in the past few decades has been represented by software. And of course, for people interested in history, I think an important thing to ponder is what does one do with the history of a piece of software once it goes into the archive, right? That once the software is done and is, we've all moved on to the next big thing, what do you do to <clears throat> keep that software in a way that later generations can come back and trace the development and see how this was done? Um, that is still a problem that is not exactly well answered yet. Uh, part of what we are doing here is to try and do it by example, do it by practice, um, <clears throat> find some of this stuff and see how we can use it in a way to illuminate some of the work that was done in that era. So with that, let me start through. Um, the talk is about, as you've heard, the talk is about a computer named Whirlwind, which was done at MIT. Uh, the building is still there. It's called the BARTA building on Mass Ave. Um, Whirlwind was a program, a project that was done here, uh, first brought online in 1949. Um, at that time, there were not a lot of computers around. Uh, John von Neumann's famous first draft if only any of us could be could write a first draft and be famous from it without ever doing the second draft, I don't know. But <clears throat> it was a, an amazing piece of work, of course, and very influential. Um, so the machine was built a few years after the first draft and incorporates a, a, an amazing amount of the idea, intellectual idea that uh, von Neumann and his colleagues had, had brought forward. Um, in modern terms, you'd say it's a 16-bit parallel computer built with vacuum tubes. Um, this was uh, at a time when everyone was doing serial computers because they were so big and expensive. Um, Whirlwind was the fastest in the world at the time at about 50,000 operations per second. 50,000. Today, you'd say Arduino, hmm, about 100, and 100 or 200 times faster than that. Um, it was also the most expensive computer ever built in that in that era, at coming in at about $3 million. Um, and as we'll see, ultimately, that was a bargain. Um, <clears throat> this, the software that we're working on here um, was triggered by the Cold War. Uh, following World War II, there was the development both of We've seen Oppenheimer, yeah, okay, people have seen Oppenheimer's, yeah, okay, so you know what he made. Um, there was that, um, and also, of course, uh, long-range airplanes that uh, could deliver uh, Mr. Oppenheimer's gift to humanity. Um, and for, <clears throat> for Americans, this was a bit of a wake-up call. Hey, wait a minute, you mean they can actually come and attack like us? You mean like our place? Oh my God, what are we gonna do? Um, the Air Force was newly formed, and the political environment shifted in ways that suddenly something must be done uh, ASAP. Um, MIT, of course, had a long history of defense work through World War II um, and responded, you need a computer. And the Air Force said, a what? And MIT said, don't worry, it'll be great. And we have one, by the way. And yeah, it kind of needs some funding. Um, <clears throat> and from there, a partnership was born, um, which ultimately grew into a thing called the semi-automated ground environment stage, which was a 
key part of the defense of the United States during the Cold War. So it turned into a humongous program, which um, uh, in retrospect made the $3 million for the prototype whirlwind look like a bargain. Okay, so why are we doing this? The Computer History Museum in California has um, a thousand tapes left over from Whirlwind, a combination of paper tapes and magnetic tapes. Um, there are various sources around which, including um, the MIT archive and Dome, which have uh, over 2,000 documents left over from this program. They were um, required to submit reports all the time, given the amount of government funding, so uh, they were um, they had a department of report writing, and <clears throat> consequently, we can go mine that material and go learn about the machine. So the obvious thing is we have all these documents, we have all these tapes, let us put them together and see what we can make and what we can get. Um, obviously, as a technology guy, you say, well, okay, we'll make a simulator, um, and that was the start of, the, of this project. Um, in this particular case, uh, this little this piece of Cold War history, um, the initial task they were given by the Air Force is we have interceptor aircraft, we have attackers coming in, we have a radar station. Could you please direct the interceptors to hit the attackers? Um, simple problem. Um, do it in real time, which of course in, in those days for a computer that was not the normal kind of request because computers were the things you piled your punch cards into to run your monthly payroll. Um, but uh, the servo mechanism lab guys kind of naturally thought in terms of real time and consequently designed Whirlwind in order to work in that environment. Um, uh, so the, <clears throat> the goal of the program then was simply to Simply connect Whirlwind to real radar stations, interpret the signals, figure out which, where the targets and interceptors are, and compute a heading to get an interceptor to head for a target and intercept them. Um, the, <clears throat> the underlying mathematics are not very complicated. It's just, you know, just geometry but it has to be done in real time and it has to be done in an environment where, uh, of course, the target may not cooperate and keep going in a straight line. So you've got to keep assessing it every, every seconds, every few seconds and make sure the interceptor stays on track. Um, there's a document that describes this. Um, there are a bunch of, the, the document is quite complete, but I think the important part for this moment is that this resulted in a demo, which was done late in 1951. Um, the demo ran on Whirlwind, and it fit into all of the available memory of Whirlwind, which totaled 256 words. And of course, in these days, you would say, oh, you mean 256 million words, don't you, Anderson? No, 256 words, period. Um, how hard could it be to write a program 256 words long? Okay, so um, in, <clears throat> in our simulation world, um, what we do is uh, we fly a couple of these airplanes, simulated airplanes, of course, I don't have a real radar station. They did. Um, so they actually ran this demo with real airplanes and real radar. Um, and, and the memos say, oh, don't worry, we fly them at different altitudes. So if it accidentally works too well, we won't have an accident. Um, and I'm sure if they ever had, it would have been high fives all around. But, okay, so in, 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 um, in simulation land, we can fly the interceptor and the target um, and simulate the radar and then compute the headings and tell the interceptor which way to go to hit the target. Um, Whirlwind also had graphical output, which was another thing that simply did not exist at the time. Um, there was, this was, I think we can say, the first computer where they intentionally had graphical output. 
um, uh, machines like the Manchester machine before it used CRT memory and consequently kind of by accident there were sometimes images, you, you could put images on the screen. But this was a case where they actually said we want to have this interact with people through uh, graphical representations. So what you see when running this, this program is uh, what looks like a radar screen. You see, you see the different aircraft <clears throat> flying, through, for flying through the airspace. Um, the, uh, the text in the top left is my debugging help, um, but what you might see on the bottom line of those four lines of text uh, where <laughs> you can't quite read the word heading, um, it says XX nothing, XX nothing, nothing. Um, that actually would have been displayed on lights on the machine. It's binary coded decimal, and that is the computed heading. And so to run this experiment in, in a real lab, they had the radar operator sitting in front of this thing with the phone. Computer would compute the heading. The radar operator would talk to the pilot, the interceptor pilot, and say, dude, turn it to 3.30. And the interceptor pilot would do so. And the result of this was a feedback loop which could be used to direct the interceptor to, to the target uh, without even, I mean, of course, without necessarily having the target fly a straight line. Um, <clears throat> so that we can now do in simulation. Um, I plotted the results uh, from a run of the simulator. The orange line at my target uh, is kind of boring. It just keeps going without uh, without paying it any attention to whether anyone's chasing them or not. Um, the yellow line would be the optimal track if you did this with you know perfect knowledge of the situation. The blue line is what Whirlwind actually does, and it's close, it's not perfect, and um, one of the things we've tried to study now is where did their approximations go right and where did they not go quite so right? And um, in a very short program, there are many compromises, of course. So what we're trying to understand is how much of that did they actually know about and how much of it was just, oh my God, you know, we can barely get this to work at all. Um, okay, so from this we can observe, um, uh, as we just said, it works. Uh, the, the track is not perfect and there's some back and forth on studying why it's not perfect. Um, but I have to say one of the things I certainly learned from this is, holy cow, how in the world did they debug this stuff, right? I mean, this is really hard. Um, the program is very dense, and <clears throat> uh, for them, it was running in real time, and they don't have a computer to simulate the environment, right? They have to use the real environment. They do record it on magnetic tape, but still, you got to play it back and watch what it does and think very hard about what it's supposed to be doing. Um, it's real time. You can't single step it even, right? If you stop, then the real data keeps going and you can't start again. So um, I, I think one of the things to, to, to look at in this is how in the world did they ever learn to debug this stuff? You know, when nobody had computers, uh, somehow they had to make up almost everything uh, as they were doing it. Okay, um, as we go forward on this stuff, um, <clears throat> what I want to do is um, take, a, take a broader look at the rest of the development of air defense in the continental U.S. That uh, this demo in 1951 was the very first but it went on for 30 years or so, and there was a lot of development there. And it'd be interesting to see how the algorithms uh, were refined. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting about this is the programming environments. They started out with literally writing code with a pencil on a piece of paper and having someone type the octal bytes, right? you know, octal, uh, octal onto the tape. 
And by the end of the decade, they had not an operating system, but at least uh, you know, pretty con a pretty good assembler and an environment to use it. And that was a really interesting era where everyone involved in this realized, uh oh, this software stuff is kind of hard. What are we going to do? And there was an enormous amount of innovation in that era. And with that, I will say thank you. <laughs>